This is George Gilbert. We're on the ground at Databricks. We're with Joseph Bradley, the brains behind uh, Spark Machine Learning. And we are talking about how to build um, a machine learning, not just a pipeline, but a process, not in terms of tools, but in terms of activities. So having said that, um, Joseph, take us through um, how Spark would put together sort of an end-to-end -end process, a set of activities where we want to be constantly learning and constantly putting those learnings in the form of a model back, back into production. Right. That's a great question. And so I'll start off very high level, um, really quoting a professor I had <laughs> in terms of defining what machine learning's goal is. And okay. that would be to take experience, um, modify behavior in order to into something which improves performance at some metric, uh, and to do this back over time. This was um, from Tom Mitchell, a, a okay. major name in machine learning. And playing this back into what an organization might want to do with, say, Apache Spark. Okay. What this means is essentially first, someone needs to define the problem. What is the performance you're trying to improve and how do you measure actually how that's being improved? Pick a, pick so, a domain just for to be definitely. concrete. Sure. So uh, let's take something, uh, say, very straightforward, such as uh, say their users in coming to a site and you want to predict um, which ad you should show them. <laughs> sort of a stereotypical machine learning okay. uh, thing in industry, but a case where there is like a clear um, uh, mechanism which is going on. You are trying to model the user's behavior, and the performance of your model is easy to quantify in terms of whether or not the user actually looks at the app. OK. And so I think that the first way which Spark helps uh, an organization get started with that problem is simply in its basic, very interactive process of analysis, allowing a user to understand the data, do rapid prototyping, and so forth. From there, uh, there's, you then enter the step of putting it into production and actually starting a constant feedback loop of monitoring how it's doing and updating it as needed. OK. Uh, so if if so, you've got this feedback loop, which is focused on the metrics that you want to improve, which is, right. I assume, the, the click through rate or or something like that. Sure. Um, and so, when you've got that feedback loop, what what happens next in in the process? How do you take that feedback and improve the model? Right. So there are several possibilities. Um, I'll group them into one, say, uh, batch updates, and the other online learning, which you had mentioned before. But ultimately, it is just about updating the model with new training data in order to either improve its performance overall or possibly follow the changing behavior of, say, your user demographic. OK, so if we're taking, if we're taking um, uh, structured streams, and we're right. doing continual um, online learning. Um, in that case, uh, we might, in an automated fashion, uh, build several models um, and look at the efficacy or the accuracy of each one and, and sure. test those. Sure. T today, I assume, uh, a data scientist would be involved in that process. Right. Yeah, so to get more concrete, I think in terms of how you would actually use, say, MLlib, um, you would, sure, for example, fit several possible models, presumably um, tuning them, figuring out what features you would use, so forth, on, offline, on data offline. And then you could potentially either test on held out data offline or put them into your production system maybe just sitting in the back, sort of making mock predictions 
um, but in order to see really how they do in real time, in order to figure out which one's best and which one you should really put into your production. So this test process is sort of like the learning itself. It could be either batch or it could be sort of, uh, it could be online, but, but not really online, sort of. Def it's, it's in the background. Definitely. Okay. And there I think it's critical, as you said, to have people with a data science background involved where that kind of knowledge and statistics and so forth knowledge is needed to make sure that the way you are testing that model to be put into production is really mimicking how it will actually be used in practice. For example, if, say, user behavior is changing over time, it could be really bad to tune your model for data from five years ago, as opposed to, say, testing on a smaller amount of data, but from a more recent time. OK. So then let's talk about the deployment step, sure. whether you've done it, whether you've tested it offline on recent data, mm -hmm. or whether you've tested it online, but without serving up um, live answers. Uh, right. you know, to, to a real audience. Mm -hmm. When you pick the model you want to use, right. what are the options for putting it into production? That's a great question. And uh, yeah, there are a few. Um, so I think we had mentioned before um, what is ter we're calling ML persistence, which is uh, the ability in MLlib to take a model and save it out uh, to uh, essentially a format which can uh, be read back in into another Spark context, uh, possibly in another language, definitely on a, uh, a different Spark deployment, and then execute it in exactly the same way. Um, this is nice if, for example, um, yeah, you have, say, a data scientist develop something in, say, Python, and then it needs to be deployed within the JVM. Um, another option is to actually take that model and then move it completely outside of Apache Spark if your production system, for some reason, you know, either because of you know, uh, constraints of that cluster or because uh, yeah, uh, of whatever business constraints, needs to uh, operate outside of Apache Spark. In that case, um, models can be serialized uh, in a couple different ways. Um, there is limited PMML support, just a model export format. Um, there is also work towards actually supporting, um, yeah, a, as I mentioned, more local implementations of MLlib models, where you could potentially use the MLlib format and read it back in, but execute this outside of a Spark context. Okay. Um, and I think that this in particular, which is ongoing work, um, is going to be super valuable for the community. Where you're doing it outside the Spark context. Right. Okay. And essentially what that gets you is the ability to execute MLlib models in exactly the same way, using the same code paths, um, but uh, being able to deploy it in your particular application, which uh, can can have fewer requirements than if you were deploying it. Okay, might or might Spark. not include Spark. Right. In this case, you're using Spark at design time, not at runtime. Right. Okay. So now these are related to operations. Tell sure. us some of the things you could do for building and testing, and um, or building and testing the model and, and deploying the model, but in increasingly automated fashion. What, what exists today, and what do you see coming down the road sure. to help? Definitely. Uh, so currently, what there is now, uh, in order to help uh, data scientists start building these models, um, I think the biggest effort, which was actually driven by uh, another uh, M uh, Spark committer here at Databricks, Shangri Meng, um, was what's often called ML pipelines. And this was the effort to first base ML transformations for features and uh, models and tuning around data frames. 
and then also to provide sort of tooling in order to string those together into complex machine learning workflows. Uh, so what, what this allows is essentially, you know, traditionally when you think of machine learning, you might think of, say, doing a random forest or linear regression or something like that. But really, a whole lot of the work goes into munging your original data into whatever numerical features the machine learning algorithm expects. And this is arguably like the most important part of machine learning because it's really how you're phrasing your problem in the first place. Um, so a lot of these steps may be taken. And, and that phrasing is the sort of the knobs that you're putting on the model, the features or right. the parameters. Exactly. Okay. Yes. It's like, do you represent an email that you're looking at as, say, uh, a set of word counts? Or do you, um, you know, maybe look at pairs of words? Or maybe much more complex and, and expressive ways of representing it? And by making um, the, the tr transformations and, and the, um, the es estimators? Sure. In, in data frames, you have a uniform construct to string everything together more easily. Right. It's, and it's meant to sort of help data scientists yeah, and picture this workflow as taking their original input data frame and every transformation is essentially modifying that data frame, maybe appending new columns of new features you've generated, uh, maybe pruning some if you're doing feature selection, uh, feeding through models which add new columns with predictions or probabilities, that sort of thing, and being able to phrase that complex workflow in a really uniform, intuitive way. Okay. So that's, I think, the most impactful thing which is there right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you're, uh, so then, so then that that ML pipeline. Right. Um, has uh, one or more models and potentially an ensemble sure. that gets, uh, as you were saying earlier, deployed either you know outside the Spark context, within the Spark context, uh, potentially scaled out to a cluster, um, mm -hmm. and as we talked about, either online learning or batch. Um, now, over time, how might you see uh, greater levels of automation Right. move into this process? That's a good question. I think there are a number of ways there could be automation. Um, certainly, well, the, the easy one to answer, I think, is you'd mentioned scaling out. And there are really all of these elements are designed to scale out. Okay. Um, that is something we're worrying about now and which will, you know, I'm sure speed and scalability will continue to improve in the future, but is something which we're, we're really always focusing on. And how about the, the feature selection? Yes. Other elements such as like how do you generate features? How do you select them? Which models do you even use? Right. You know, do you use logistic regression or a random forest? Um, that I think is a case where there are ways to start to automate that and there will always be ways to improve and always be need for a human in the loop. As far as the ways to start to automate that, um, I'd say first, um, there's certainly the opportunity to provide automation where you say, try multiple models automatically, try multiple ways of feature generation, and just rely on what we currently have for automated model tuning um, to read, fr like figure out from held out data, which of these ways the is best. The test data. Right. And the, so the, the machine learning machinery would generate right. a couple models, a couple of, uh, sets of features right. for the models, and then test and evaluate those models. I, I think that's something which certainly quite a few researchers are looking at, and um, some pro open source projects are even starting to look at, but which is definitely still in the research domain. Okay. I think the other big aspect which machine learning can help with is not automation in terms of like push a button and everything's done, but automation in terms of telling you what's going wrong or how you might improve. You can compute a lot of statistics after you fit a model, which indicate whether or not that model is great. 
I think that right now you require a data scientist or a statistician to really read those statistics and understand how to improve from there. But I think that some more work could be done, maybe not necessarily using machine learning, maybe more of a design question, but in order to make it easier for a data scientist or a non-expert to take their current model, get feedback, and know how to improve it. So it's a, um, the, the machine learning uh, process would include some sort of, it's like visibility into how it made the decisions to, or recommendations. Um, exactly. Or, or visibility into um, the, the data scientist in uh, where his decisions um, made things more accurate or less accurate. Yes, I, I think really both aspects. Okay. And right, okay. that interpretability and visibility is, is key. Yeah. All right, let me, uh, let me just make sure that before we lose you, we, we've, we've got uh, all the key questions we wanted to put to you. Um, oh, our, our notebooks have uh, you know, become sort of more and more pervasive in Definitely. the uh, Spark uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Might we see uh, machine learning pipelines start to have uh, graphical um, representations mm -hmm. that would make it easier for data scientists or data engineers or right. you know perhaps even others to start prototyping? Right. Uh, that's a great question and it's something which um, well <laughs> I'll admit, Databricks demoed um, a sort of like an early prototype of that uh, at an earlier Spark Summit. But it's something which I would definitely like to provide. And there, there are multiple ways of providing this. I think partly in um, simply visualization and being able to sort of deep dive into elements of an existing pipeline. And there is also the, the case of sort of more of a point and click drag um, kind of GUI for building these complex pipelines. And uh, I, you know, both are certainly, I think, quite valuable, um, especially, I think, just for communicating the, the intuition, being able to look at the overall picture of what an ML workflow is doing. Yeah. Would those be open source, or is that you know, proprietary mm -hmm. Databricks value add? Right, uh, good question. Um, I think certain elements of it um, will be open source and certain elements um, will certainly be Databricks uh, value add. Um, and I think a lot depends on sort of whether um, it is something which can easily fit into one project or the other and also, um, you know, how, what interest is, you know, where interest is coming from and really who's pushing for these things. Right. Yeah. All right, Joseph, on that, I think we had a very, very uh, a lengthy set of interviews with you and uh, covered a lot of ground. That was uh, most enlightening. This is George Gilbert. We are on the ground at Databricks. We've been with Joseph Bradley talking about uh, machine learning in Spark 2.x and its futures. Uh, we will be back uh, with more interviews. <laughs>